It's another day here at the Comeback Team Studios. This is your host, Beck Lover, reporting again in quarantine. And today I have an amazing story of a man whose life started in Sarajevo right before the war. And he has an amazing story of war, losing family, survival, and coming to America against all odds and restarting his life here in this country of ours. I'm very proud to announce my guest, Abdo Gajcevic. Did I say that correctly? Yes, sir. Abdo Gajcevic. You're right. Yeah, got it on point. Good. It's, it's those Slavic names sometimes, they throw me off a little bit. You know, they're not easy. I know. How are you doing today? Good. Yourself? I'm still bunkered down here. I, I can't wait to get back to my studio. I hope my guests and uh, my followers forgive me for the quality of the sound and the video, but everybody, I mean, listen, even the big shots are doing this stuff too. Like even CNN and all these guys, they're doing it this way right now. So the quality's a little off, you know? Yeah, that's fine. You look like you're in the studio. I'm doing my best here. <laughs> so how has quarantine been treating you, man? I mean, what, what have you been up to? I've been actually working every day ever since. I do a commercial uh, building management and slash real estate. So you've never stopped working throughout the, the no, quarantine? No, huh? I've been working every day. What's the mood been like now? You're in Manhattan? Yes, uh, 17 and Broadway. Um, I've been driving though, so I honestly, I could tell you the city has been dead ever since. You said you're dealing with commercial property, right? Yeah. So have they, I mean, those offices are not even open right now, right? Honestly, uh, out of 220, we have about seven or eight that are, you know, get visited per day. That they're open. Yeah. The rest is shut down. You think that the commercial uh, market's going to take a big hit from this? You think? You think there's going to be a lot of exodus? What, what do you think? What's it'll, your it'll opinion? It'll take time. It'll take time because um, in this case, there's a lot of small businesses where people are going to lose money, particularly in the properties I, I am. Are there a lot of like retail stores, these, these buildings that you manage? Not the stores. Yes, they are. There are they're four or five uh, eateries and a makeup store and stuff. But uh, they can't do much, man. Few deliveries here and there, that's it. I mean, there's been a lot, of, uh, a lot of stores empty all over New York City for the last 10, 15 years anyway. Yes, they, uh, they used to have lines lined up outside. Now it's... Uh, you it's know. a Armageddon. It's like what they said, the online businesses have really uh, taken control of that sector and uh, that's why a lot of these stores are vacant right now. Yeah. I, I gotta tell you, as much as I hate the concept of Amazon. What I mean by that is I don't think any company should have that type of power or that type of control. Amazing, I, do right? I do believe in monopolies and antitrust and all that stuff. And our country used to break up companies that were too big. I mean, we broke yeah. up uh, AT&T back in the day and Bell Atlantic and all these other things. But uh, my cons you know, what happened with me, my moment when I, was, I tried to resist as long as I could. I, I, was, at I was at Bed Bath & Beyond. I'm waiting online. There's like five people in front of me. And you know, you know that, 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 that agony you go through when you're just waiting online and there's this stupid stuff going on in front of you, like where the person is talking too much. Like you just want to pay for your shit and go home, you know? Get, get out. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Hell yeah. And with that Eastern European temper, you know, I'm sitting online. I'm going, I'm here waiting 30, 40 minutes for this, to pay for this stupid spatula, right, for my kitchen. <laughs> I could have ordered the damn thing online to be there the next day. I never have to go anywhere. Yeah, you don't have to bother going out. I flipped out on the line. I flipped out. I'm not proud of this, but I had a moment where I flipped out. I said, this is why you won't have a job very soon. I point True, to man. That's why Bezos is and, the richest man on earth. And this is why Amazon is taking over the world, and I am done. I will never shop in a store ever again. Everyone looked at me. I said, the rest of you are more too if you do. But I yeah. still don't support the fact that that one company. There should be multiple companies that do what he does. It should be. See, uh, they have, you know, I can't even think of, you know, like Walgreens and other stores trying to do the thing, like Target, but they're not even, they're not, they're even, not even closer. This guy's got it. Lot, with this guy, yeah, this guy's on, every, got, everybody's got him on speed dial, man. And you know what? This epidemic, pandemic, I should say, or plandemic, as some people would say, plan, plan, sure. has, has really, sped up the success of that company in the sense that everyone's using it now. Like you couldn't go out your house, right? I mean, this is like, this is like 
it couldn't have been a better storm for him, you know? Yeah, Perfect man. storm. It's true. So, Abdo, um, you know, I really want to get into your life. But before you do that, I always like to, you know, I, like to, like, I, I think people are starting to understand my format. I like to have small talk, man. I've never believed in interrogating your guests. I, I hate that. You know? and Absolutely. Some of my followers, they, um, they get mad. They think I talk too much. I definitely have interrupted a lot of my guests in the past, which I'm no longer doing. We, we might be related because I like to talk too much, too. I think a lot of this from Eastern Europe, we do, especially with coffee. It's the coffee lifestyle, man. <laughs> uh, it's that <laughs> Balkan lifestyle. Cafe, smoke three packs of cigarettes, drink yeah. 20 espressos, and then they I wonder am- why... Yeah, and then they wonder why our people dropped dead at 45. Ah, oh, he died of a heart attack. I don't know how. Well, maybe because yeah, the yeah. guy, had, yeah, maybe the guy had 20 espressos that day and smoked it's three cool. packs of marble reds. That's why he dropped dead for lunch. Am I wrong or no? No, no, you're right, man. You're right. Anytime I go down there, like when I go to Bosnia or, or Montenegro, where my father is, everybody smokes and nonstop. It's amazing. Nonstop. Morning, night, afternoon. House, no house. Coffee, coffee after coffee, man. <laughs> Every spot, it's it's amazing. Like you they think, party. like they think, like Americans, you know, like us Americans, we drink, you know, the Americans, you know, over here in our country, you know, they go to Starbucks two times a day, three times a day. Let me tell you something. One of those <laughs> Starbucks coffees ain't nothing compared That's to the express. Down. It's watered down for sure. My friend, let me tell you something. How these people over there, they drink 20, 30 espressos, yeah, a day. Hardcore. Black Chimney tar. Chimney smoking. Black tar. I love the cafes over there. Yeah, coffee, yeah. It's, uh, it, it's, uh, how am I going to say? Uh, you really enjoy it. It's a different type of, uh, you know, socializing, drinking coffee back home or here. Here, you just grab and go and you really don't enjoy it. At all. But you know what? New York is coming a long way with that. New York? Yes. There's a lot Absolutely. of uh, small, uh, you know, espresso type of bars and love them. Yeah, European style. What I've noticed, and you know, as someone who used to indulge in the New York nightlife, I was very involved. Uh, my family owned one of the biggest nightclubs in Manhattan. I've thrown hundreds of events in my lifetime. Um, when you leave alcohol behind in New York City, you know, I no longer drink. I stopped drinking about uh, eight years ago, almost. God bless you. And. Um, Thank you. And, um, you know, New York City is a really hard place to, to, to be sober, in, right? There's a bar and a pub and a club, and, and drinking is really embedded into the culture of the New Yorker, right? I mean, it it's like, you know, after work, you go have a drink. And I, I guess the American culture, for, for that fact, uh, it's a big part of the culture. And, you know, for a long time, I, I wasn't necessarily that I missed the drinking of the alcohol, but I missed the social aspect of it. Social what I love too. about yeah, and what I loved about Europe, and not just, you know, Eastern Europe, but also, you know, Western Europe, but I would say even more Eastern Europe, because the unemployment rates to the roof, right? They got time on their hands. Is like you said, the experience of that coffee, that espresso, half an hour, one hour, two hours, like they'll go, they'll have a coffee with a seltzer water, and they will just have an amazing conversation for hours. Yeah. And yeah, on a daily basis, yeah. And you can't even do that when you're drunk, right? I mean, you get too drunk. You're, I mean, how are you going to talk? I mean, you're drunk, right? So, so I, I do like that New York has started to have these espresso bars, and I do see it. Do, they've been doing pretty well. And I'm glad that they're not all branded like uh, Starbucks, you know? Right. I like the fact that it has a European feel to it. It's really nice. Right, right. So um, not to get too, too off of subject, because I do want to get into your remarkable story, your horrible loss. And it's, you know, I don't want to jump into it right now, but we're going to get there in a second. I just want to, because we want to talk about kind of current events and what's going on. I always like to give my audience the ability to see kind of how my guest thinks and views the world a little bit. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the internet. Everyone's talking about conspiracy theories and this and that. And it's everywhere you look. And, you know, I'm into that kind of stuff, but it's like almost overwhelming. Like almost every post now is about something. What is your true gut heart feeling about the whole virus? I know it's just a thought. Maybe it's not what you, you know, none of us know 100% what's going on. I think only God knows that. But yeah. what is your hunch? What do you truly think, man? I mean, do you think there's an agenda? Do you think I have to by accident? What is but your there, opinion of the virus? There's a definitely agenda because you just don't shut down the whole world. Uh, 
just because some kind of virus is going on. You know, I, I'm trying to think that this is leading towards mandatory vaccination at the end of the day. You know, uh, we heard about this, but we obviously didn't pay attention, most of us, about uh, overpopulation. You know, these big, big, uh, how am I going to say, rich guys. You know, I think their goal is to destroy our generation, the one after us, our kids and them, so they don't produce. Simple as that. I'm thinking that vaccine might just destroy the, you know, how am I going to say, the, the reproductive, growth. Reproductive, yeah, reproductive process. Yeah, I think that's... Almost, almost like digital neutering, basically. Something like that, where, where you're not going to have a choice, but to get a vaccine you know, in order to work, travel, or do things like that. As hopefully, far as the... Hopefully that's not the case, but it just not, it doesn't seem right. It doesn't look good. For me, the timing of the virus is very fishy. I mean, they, they, they've been attacking. I'm not here to support the president one way or the other. Meaning, I don't care if you vote for him or don't vote for him, because I don't like the way the whole system's set up anyway, to be honest with you. I think a true democracy, anybody should be allowed to run everybody should be allowed in the first round before they get eliminated to speak publicly so anybody can be seen right Ooh, not yeah. just who has not just who has money yeah and i don't um, think I any would, other president i don't think any other president would be ready for this type of uh no president. no you know and this is, this is unprecedented you know nobody yeah. nobody's ready for this no but i think he's do. i think he's doing the best he can but here but here's, my, uh, here's my here's my beds and respirators or whatever they call them ventilators i don't know whatever. whether the virus was released on purpose or not i think we both agree that whether it was released on purpose or not there are people behind the scenes that are trying to use this virus for their own purposes for their own agendas okay there's definitely this battle between freedom fighters you know people that love the constitution the bill of rights and people who are trampling those things because they want to feel safe and protected for a virus that has proven to be less than a 1% kill rate to cause this type of economic impact. I've already lost family to the virus. I've oh, lost man. a friend who was killed by police. It was all over the news. I don't want to mention the name. Yes. Very, I, I, okay. I, I, I know. I can only imagine what happened to, 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 that, to that friend of mine. The circumstances and the stress of everything 100% played a role in his death. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Wow. So I think more people will die from what has happened as a consequence of the virus than the virus itself. This wave of virus, it's to, to weaken all of us. You know, weaken the whole nation, the whole uh, earth population. It's going to weaken it. And then the next round will be vaccination, which will just be a final nail in the would, coffin. I think that's you, what it is. Would you take that vaccine? I won't. I wouldn't. Would you I be willing wouldn't. to die not to take it? Hundred percent. And uh, I have two kids, which I would, I would do anything, you know, for them. Now, I'm ask you another question. If they say that you can't go back to work unless you have proof of that vaccine, and your kids can't go back to school without the vaccine, what would you do? I will find. The, I will find a country on this earth, if there is any, where I could work. How about if you're not allowed to travel out of the country without the vaccine? You would, they would have to let you go. If not, then there's a problem. Then there's a problem. Protest, I think, what would erupt. It's automatic, automatic war, I tell you that. And no, I think so, too. That's why I don't think... That's why I don't think... I'm sorry to cut you off. I, that's why I don't think... That's why I don't think that they will be that stupid to try with us, the generation that knew the world before the internet. Yeah. I think that they're conditioned yeah. because everything they do is very slow. Absolutely. I said that in the beginning. Uh, look, they're giving, they're giving us two weeks of shutdown. You think they're going to tell you, hey, we're going to shut down for two months and you guys all stay. We would have no. a different situation. It would be people walking with the, with the... That's why they said two weeks first. That's a great example. Now, the reason I ask you these questions and my audience might be wondering is because you are someone that saw your government turn on you. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. You are also someone that saw our country collapse. Yeah, man, it's, it's, it's really, really frightening in one way. Which is why you live here in the United States of America. And I've always said this, and I mean no disrespect to my fellow Americans. I'm a first-generation American. I was born here because my family fought against communism in Albania. 
and they fought against uh, the socialist regime, communist regime of Serbia, and moreover, when really it transferred to Milosevic, uh, that's right. really when it when shit hit the fan in that country. Right. In, in any event, they ended up in America because of what was going on in those places. Absolutely. I have so and many. Friends, <clears throat> sorry, they come. They came from where I come from. You know, Bosnia, Croatia, Kosovo. Just because of that one disastrous war that happened. Serbs also that didn't want to fight in the war. Yeah. Who didn't want to take and you know they they all, I've met some of them over here. They left. They're like they were trying to draft me to go to the war in Bosnia. I didn't want to go. They came to yeah. America. Yeah. So the reason why I'm mentioning all this is because um, I've always believed that it is the the immigrants. And the sons of the immigrants, which is how this whole country started, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Are the ones that have always kept the fight for the democracy going more than maybe the fourth or fifth generation American, because they were always born in this beautiful country, man, with rights and stuff like that, and they didn't see the dark side of what it means to be they, in a they, socialist. They definitely didn't see. They 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 didn't follow. They didn't want to see it. Or a communist Cause, country. Cause look. The way this is set up right now, like you said, with all social media and every, all the distractions, new generations don't have to look what's going on around the world. They rather look Twitter, uh, what do you call Instagram and stuff like that. They, they don't go into, a, you know, news rooms and watch, you know, crisis and stuff. It's not, it's not different times right now. So I've always said it's, it's this blood, this fresh blood that always comes into our country that left where they came from that keep that fight for keeping this country free and democratic alive, maybe more than the people that have been here 10 generations. Yeah. So I agree. That, that's some of the benefits uh, to those that are listening and watching of having fresh blood come into the country. But I do believe in legally. I do understand that there's some instances where it's done illegally. You kind of, you have no choice in a lot of people. But I feel like those cases, you know, and a lot of them, they get their papers. The judge hears them out. This is what happened. This is how, yeah. because this was a country that said, give us your poor and give us your weak. And, you know, so I've always believed in that. So what I want to do then, brother, we'll transition kind of into this. So we're here today and we're in the week. We're in the week of the 28th anniversary of the start of the Bosnian War. Yes, sir. That era was in April, but, you know, in this time period, 28th anniversary. Yes. And um, you have a, a very tragic story that took place during that event. But what I want to do is I want to kind of start with your life before the war in Sarajevo and Bosnia, yeah. which occurred in the early 90s in Eastern Europe, the Balkans, to be more exact. And I want to kind of paint this picture that people don't really know. You know, uh, Yugoslavia was a country that had many different ethnic groups in yes. it. Multi-ethnical. Slovenians, if. Croatians, Serbians, Bosnians, Albanians, Roma. Uh, we have Tur a lot of Jews. We have a lot of Jews in, in Sarajevo. Still, Jews. Yeah. Uh, really. All types of different people. Yeah. And it became a really cool place. Even though it was a socialist slash communist country, it wasn't like China. Citizens had a lot, of, a lot of freedom. They had jobs. Yeah. It, was somewhat, it was also capitalistic. Yeah, m m more so, yeah. And, you know, I spoke to a lot of people on all ends. If we're going to be fair and be fair, a lot of them said that during the time of Tito, who was the ruler of Yugoslavia, that everyone, right. did, everyone did pretty good. Like, he kept it in balance. Everyone kind of felt that they were equally treated. And, you know, I spoke to family members. They said they had jobs. Yes, there was a little bit of, like, you know, a little bit of discrimination here and there, but it wasn't like what we saw in the 80s and the 90s yeah. with the collapse of, uh, of, you know, when Tito passed away and then that other literally madman, in my opinion. I think he might have even been transplanted there, who knows, by foreign powers, right? To destroy yeah, the I mean, country from with. I, I mean, listen, I lost a lot of family in that war, but I want to hear your story. I want my audience to hear your story. The picture is this. This place used to be amazing at one point. They hosted the Olympics. Yeah, they they even made cars. They were called the Yugos. I mean, this country had manufacturing, 
people had income, people had jobs, people had cars, people were educated. They had a really formidable, formidable military, right? They were a power within Europe. They were Their always currency was good. Always top 10 in the military. Currency was strong, could travel abroad. You didn't really need visas to like 80% of the countries you guys went to. I mean, it was yeah. a functioning, really nice, multi-ethnic state that for a brief glimmer of hope showed what a ethnic utopia could be like if people could get along. Yeah, man. It's true. Exactly. Right on. Now, um, you were born in Sarajevo, Bosnia, yes? Correct. So that's where your life starts. Yes, sir. What year was that? What, what decade? You were born in the 60s, 70s? I'll tell you exactly. 75. So it makes me 45 years old. Okay, not bad, not bad. 75, you were born in Sarajevo. Now, uh, tell us a little bit about your family, your life there, what it was like, what you remember about living in Sarajevo. You know, I tell you, uh, I'll, I'll start with my parents. You know, my pops, or should I say my dad, my late dad, came from Montenegro, the Sanjak area, uh, very close to Albanian border, a small town called Gusine, and as you might know or heard of. He came to Sarajevo when he was a teenager, really. He went to school um, and he became a, became a mailman, though, in one of the, the main streets in Sarajevo. If, you, if I had to compare, it would be a Fifth Avenue of Manhattan. He worked in uh, Titova Ulica, which is, you know, Tito Street. Really a uh, hard worker all his life, built two houses, you know, took care of three of us me and my two brothers, older and younger. Um, took care of his brothers, three brothers. Well, two of them end up coming here, and <clears throat> one, unfortunately, uh, died together with him. So he, he was really a, a, a family man, hard worker. If I can interrupt for one second. Now, you said he was able to build two houses. Yes, sir. Working for the post office. Yes. So let's just show you something about the economic livelihood of the country at that time. Yes, 100%. It was, it was, uh, That's amazing. It was, it was a good times, yes. He had cars, right? He had a car yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, normal, normal uh, city life. We, we lived in, uh, I don't want to say suburb, but uh, neighborhood of airport, which is like right at the edge of the Sarajevo. A really nice, quiet neighborhood. How many uh, siblings did you have? I have an older brother and a younger. So it's three so, of you. Three of us, yeah. Three boys. Yeah, and my mother is she's originally from from Bosnia. My father her, uh, met her accidentally was delivering mail to one of her uncles. Hmm. She happened to be there, and and special you know, delivery, huh? Special yeah, delivery. Man. Yeah. <laughs> He's the guy from Montenegro. She's a Bosnian and, you know. Special like, delivery. We all have destinies, you know. You never know where they're going to lead you. Hey, my friend, let me tell you something. I ended up going to Kosovo and I ended up engaged within two months. So I get it. Trust me. <laughs> I, I get it. That's good. That's good. You, you know? never know, man. You never know what, where life, what life brings you. you so... Know? Your, your, your childhood seems like it was really nice. You had two homes. Your dad was doing well. Parents that loved each other. Now, do you remember what it was like living in Sarajevo when you were younger? Do you have any memories of that? Yes. I, uh, when I left Sarajevo, I was 17 years old. You know, uh, how am I going to say, man? High school times. About to graduate. Uh, but, but didn't graduate because the war, you know, broke out just before. And, so when um, you were growing up... When you grew up, you had friends that were Serbian, friends that were Croatian. Yeah, 100%, 100%. We had, all of us had friends from different, you know, ethnicity backgrounds. And all of us, Serbs were hanging out with Muslims, Croats, uh, Albanians. There was, there was no, uh, there was no any kind of separation, you know what I mean? But uh, what do we know, young kids... Same like I would t look at my 17-year-old son right now. He don't know much of, you know, it's not, those things don't interest you, you know? Let's say uh, if there is some political conflict going on, you don't know as a young kid, you really don't, you see it, but you honestly, you don't, 
you know, you don't care for it. It was a lot of, uh, at that time, I remember it was a war in Croatia, you know. It was going on, I believe, for about two years. It was really bad, but what do you know? Back then, we didn't have social media. Whatever they showed you on news, that was it. You don't know in a neighbor country what's going on. So to, to clarify for a lot of people who may not know the differences, and I mean, even sometimes I feel like maybe I get it wrong, but I mean, are the Croatians, the Serbians, and the Bosnians, aren't they basically cousins? I mean, aren't they basically the same ethnically? ethnically? Are they the same people? I it just, honestly wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to answer that correctly, to tell you the truth. It's debatable, right? I mean, it's... It's, it's very debatable because... I mean, uh, they pretty much, pretty much speak the same language, pretty much. Yes, yes. Similar. It's called Serbo-Croatian, right? Yes. I mean, they all speak a different dialect of it, right? Yes. Because listen, even the Albanians, we're one people. We come yeah. in different religions. Yes. And we have very different dialects. I have a very hard time understanding certain parts of the country. So to me, I always looked at those people as maybe being very similar. The only thing that really divided them really was religion. Yes, sir. So would you classify what happened in Bosnia 100% as a civil war? I mean, do you think it was truly a civil war? Uh, or would you consider it more of, a, of, a, of an external conflict that was brought into Bosnia? I mean, what do, what do you think? It was, it was a conflict that was designed. It was, a de it was a designed war. Why do you think it was designed? You know, honestly, I believe that also. I believe honestly, that also. I, don't, I don't think any, any leader today or, or back then don't care for a Muslim country in the middle of Europe. If, if this was happening right now, which, which is not the case. Bosnia was never a, a fully Muslim country. It was no, a Bosnia. They were Muslim, but they weren't like hardcore ISIS, Iran, whatever you want to call it. Right. You know, they were so, very so, moderate, you know? So obviously they found these dogs of Milosevic and Karadzic and all these, uh, you know, sick minds just to, you know, give them an idea. They, they were ready to do it, you know, just to, to take more land of some, some from Croatia, some from Bosnia, some from Kosovo, and make it into a big Serbia. That's, that's, that was the initial you know, plan. There was propaganda definitely uh, being fed to, to people. We all know that, you know, you know what's scary, and this is what bothers me about what's going on now with censorship. We know for a fact that, that, that Milosevic used to censor the news, 100%. Right. You know, the Serbian people living in Belgrade, they didn't really know what the hell was going on in Bosnia on the ground. They weren't there to see the massacres and all this other stuff. Right. And, you know, um, that's why when I start seeing these preliminary signs of censorship on the internet and stuff like that, for me, it's very troubling and very alarming. It's very I'm disturbing. Sure it's disturbing. Sure it's very disturbing for you, too, because we've seen what a dictator can do. Yes. They use the news and manipulate the news. You have a war. You have massacres. You have concentration camps. A hundred percent, man. Look, Yugoslavia again. I'm not sure at that time they're probably probably top six or seven in the world by by, you know, army power. It was a very a disciplined, very armed, very uh, heavy heavy artillery focused you know army. They didn't have. Until and Tito was brilliant that he played both sides. He played Russia and America. Yeah. So all you needed was an outsider idea. Hey, you know, we should wipe out this country and you know, maybe you take over the land. And it happened in a heartbeat. It, was, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, and obviously there, there, there has to, the war has to have followers. You're not going to just create the war and people stand back. You have to have followers. The sick minds of a neighbors or, or, or friends, so-called, uh, uh, that, that, that they just had a twisted mind, man. They would have a, you know, coffee with you, but think about how they're going to slaughter you next day. So you lived in Sarajevo. Yes. You were there up until the war started. Yes. And up we until, that, now, up until the flashpoint, up until the flashpoint, Life was normal. Uh, right? I wish I could tell you goosebumps, but uh, I, I remember it, you know, very vividly. Uh, 
thanks to our father, we escaped a day before war, one day before war. Wow. It was the, it was Bayram, it was Eid next day. His cousin came uh, from Montenegro and um, I never, I never, I'll never forget, obviously, because I was 17, I wasn't, you know, seven months. And my older brother was 18 and my younger brother was 12. I remember begging him, you know, come on, you know, war is going to break out any minute, you know. Let's go, let's go to Montenegro. Let's go where your parents are. Take your wife and kids, you know. I remember my dad saying, listen, just take my kids. Make sure they, you know, get there safe. You know, I'll be okay. I'm staying well, here. Why, why did he want to stay so bad? Why did he want to? That's the question I asked myself, you know. All your mom life. came with you? No, she stayed there. She actually survived four years of war. She stayed in the siege. She stayed in the siege and uh, went from maybe three, four different houses wow. with four, four of her sisters and about 15 kids. Wow. My, uncle, my uncle that died, his wife was pregnant at that time. At that time, just before war, she delivered a baby boy. He's still alive. Yeah, so I don't, wanna, I don't want to jump this out of sequence because there's a lot of, a lot of uh, stuff to talk about here. Yeah. So everything was normal. Childhood was normal. The ethnic tensions start flaring up because of Milosevic, yeah. maybe even because of extremists and the other ethnic groups, right? So they all came like this. What happened was, uh, you know, Croatia, uh, 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 Slovenia. Slovenia first. Let's start with Slovenia because it's top of the map. They declared the independency. They they're literally ended up with, you know, no bullets fired or shots fired too far Maybe. away yeah too you know they had a good good backup they're close Listen. to thank you and then croatia did the same thing and then and, and these wild dogs just went on it's, it's like it, it felt like they were controlling yugoslavia back then they didn't want nobody to separate and once croatia did that they ended up in a huge war with big losses as well and then two years later when when bosnia said, look, we had enough of your bullshit. We want our independence. Imagine uh, having an army that fought for two years with full, 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 you know, arms, whatever they, they wanted, they had. They came down to Bosnia and, and they were ready to, to like, you know, just slaughter people. Luckily, uh, for some heroes, it, it just stayed, stayed alive. Yeah. And what's crazy is that a lot of the... Uh... A lot of that military wasn't even from Bosnia. They were from Serbia proper or whatever it was. So for them, it wasn't like, you know, I saw in a lot of documentaries, there was even Serbians that lived in Sarajevo who decided to stay in Sarajevo and fight for the Bosnians against the Yes, those the, are the, the military. Those are the, those are the, how am I going to say? Those are the normal people, man, just like you and I. We don't think harm and, and, or bad on any color, race, or or. or, or religion you know what i mean those are normal people i don't care if they're serbs or whoever they are yes there was plenty of them they stayed and fought on a on a side of the you know country they didn't want to invaders they didn't want to kill their, their next door neighbor no yeah as a, as a matter of fact my mom lived with the serbian lady in her house because once once uh, they had to leave our house they had to just you know move all over the city and they lived with this lady for for a while because her house was empty and obviously, uh, you know, a bunch of women and kids, they had a shelter somewhere. So a Serbian woman opened her doors. Yeah. And that is an example. And that's what I'm trying to show people uh, with, with what we're talking about today. I lost a lot of family in the Kosovo War. I lost 30 people in one day. So my heart... It's really, my, it's really amazing when we say these numbers. When you think about it, it's really a great loss. It's a my great heart... Loss. My heart was full of hatred for a very long time. Yeah. And to me, I could only see black. All Serbians are bad. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, not, the I, right, that's not the right way to think. Not there, are Serbian, there are Serbians. And there are Albanians. And there are people that are good and bad in every single country. And people that believe in God or have morals, even if they don't believe in God. If they have morals and they understand that a human being has rights. Yes, man. Regardless of. Now. If a Serbian, knowing everything they see now, the videos of the concentration camps, the videos of the massacres, and they can deny that, that that happened, 
They can deny that Srebrenica was completely a crime against humanity. And it happened in the United Nations camp. Yeah, in front that of their eyes. And the world's army allowed that to happen. So I hold them more accountable than I do even the Serbs that did it. For sure. Because the Western world sat there when we promised ourselves in the Holocaust that it would never happen again in Europe, yes. in the world. And the greatest atrocities since World War II happened during the Bosnian War. Yep. And yes, one side had more firepower, which is why they were responsible for more of the death. An interesting question I wonder is, well, what happened if the firepower was in maybe the Bosnians' hands or the Croatians' hands? Would they have been any better? I tell you, you know, a lot of people don't know that the Bosnia had an embargo on weapons. Yeah, I know. We were, we were the, I don't want to say we were invaders. We were in our own country. When I say we, I wasn't there, but uh, as, as, a, as a Bosnian, uh, they, they couldn't get, buy or import weapons. I know. I remember because there was protests all over New York in front of the UN and in uh, Washington, D.C., to lift the embargo and to enact a no-fly zone because they were literally hitting you guys with jets, with tanks. I mean, you guys were a civilian population. You guys uh, how am I going to say? They were, God saved them, man. Honest to God. Because, ducks in the bow. They were shooting ducks in the bow. And, and one day in Sarajevo, you could Google it and steal a record of any, any records. Uh, Serbs fired uh, about 3,700 grenades and we're not talking about hand grenades no it's only about like artillery so heavy artillery and again uh, uh, Sarajevo is Olympic city they fired from the from up top in one day about 3700 of those and those are the I, I don't know the kind or, or the size but they're shells they're mortars 3700 so there's a lot of stuff here to digest um, the war is going on you're in Montenegro with your brothers. Yeah. Your dad stays behind. But now you said your father, you end up losing your father. Yes, sir. Uh, your father died in the very beginning. Five weeks after the war started. You lost him. Yes. You never knew that would be the last time you saw him, huh? Yeah. We never Did knew, man. We, as a... As, as a I don't want to say stupid as it sounds, but we were all uh, very, uh, how am I going to say, uh, positive. Naive. Naive. The war will never yeah. happen. In, in our own beautiful city, it would never be a war. That was the uh, initial thought from everybody, myself, and everybody else. Yeah, there might be some killing here and there, some conflict, but they won't destroy the entire city. Yeah, we thought, listen, war will never happen in our country. Because, it, again, it was ethnically you know, mixed as, as, as New York City. How did your father lose his life? Uh, we, after that happened, we never, because uh, of my mom and, and obviously my aunts, my mom had the three sisters. They all lived together in, in like house next to each other. Um, we were, uh, I'll, that's your father, yeah? Yes, sir. That's him when he uh, came to Sarajevo, I believe, in his late, early 20s. And there's a, a post, postal uniform. Nice uniform. Yeah. You know, Yugoslavia didn't mess around, man. Your father, you know, keep, keep saying what you were saying. Please don't, don't stop. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, I got caught up, caught, caught up a little bit. Um, yeah, it's emotional, but I know. Yes. Uh, I, I came across that, the last video, I came across the video by accident on YouTube. Because, you know, we always search and try to comfort our own selves with anything. That was a, a video of him when they had the independence. How am I going to say? Voting going on. And that's because you said that your house was destroyed during the war. You guys lost all of your photographs, yeah? Yes. Like any photos uh, of him or us together, honestly, was uh, or is in, in Montenegro where, where his parents' house is. So this picture that I'm showing my viewers 
is actually a picture that you found randomly. Randomly, it's a of, video of news clips randomly. of news clips of him voting when they did the referendum of whether or not Bosnia should separate from the former Yugoslavia. See the word, see the word on, on the bottom of that photo, Nezavisnosti means uh, independence of, yeah. of Bosnia and Herzegovina. In 1992. Only, yeah, that, that video is on my feed. I maybe posted it about a month ago, or maybe two months ago. Let me ask you a question. When you found it, you must have tears coming out your eyes. Yeah, man. It was, it was, it was really hard. Because, uh, you know, I, I went Googled, I did a lot of research from that day till today about anything, about any, any leads or any, you know what I'm saying, proof of, of anything. So what, what, what happened now? Let, let's get to the story. How did, how did he die to so your once, once we left the, the city of Sarajevo with his cousin, we were sound and safe next day in um, Podgorica, the capital of Montenegro. We watched the news and uh, tell you the truth, uh, it was like a movie. We couldn't believe it was, it was, it was shooting and it was, you know, grenades flying and it was really frightening. And me and my brother, old, my older brother, you know, being young, we wanted to go back because we were scared for, you know, for our parents. But you couldn't go back. The borders were shut down immediately. So. Uh, they did, from what we know, it did, they did give some resistance to, uh, to the Serb forces. And when I say they, it was all the men, the men from our block. They all got together. And honestly, they all had, you know, simple weapons because like every household had, you know, some had a gun, some had a shotgun or some who knew better hunting rifle some some who knew better or heard about you know rumors had uh, ak-47s and uh i don't know how much how much can you uh, uh resist with the with the even ak-47 with a couple uh clips of bullets if a whole squad comes down in your block with uh you know tanks and heavy artillery so what happened was uh, these are the men, right? That were were, were on the block. Yes. Uh, there's the youngest one there. Uh, it was my brother's age. He was uh, 18 years old. Fourth row, first from the left, Amir. He was uh, 18 years old. So, so that day, they uh, they were. I guess the forces were coming in, and they were trying to stop them. Yeah. So they did. Uh, like I said, they they put up resistance. And uh, one of our neighbors came in and said, look, guys, uh, we promise you we're going to transfer you to your side. You know, and uh, again, being naive or maybe being scared or being maybe looking for the exit, they were cut off. That area was cut off from, from let's say, uh, a part of Sarajevo because we were surrounded by Serbs. And... Um, they trusted him. They, uh, they trusted him. They went with them because they told him they're going to transfer him to their own side. And uh, 15 years later, we found him. 15 years. So you go, you go to Montenegro. Yeah. Your father sends you. He doesn't ask you. He sends you out of the country. The war starts the next day. Within the first weeks of that war, he's dead already. Yeah. And he was promised by the other side that they'll transfer him to another part of Bosnia. Because that's the problem that people don't understand. It was like a big spaghetti bowl. And everything was mixed in there. Serbs, yeah. Croats, Albanians, everybody lived in Sarajevo. So yeah. what I never understood and what I still don't understand is how the hell did they even know who's who and how to kill who? Or what? I mean, right. you, you kind of look the same. You look the same, kind of. You speak the same language. You do look the same. What am I talking about? Even yeah. Albanians, I hate to say it. Sometimes <laughs> I'll, look at, I'll look at videos of, of other people throughout Balkans, and we all look kind of the same, man. Yes, we have that rugged, got rugged these, face, man. These big-ass big heads. <laughs> Huge Blocking. uraniums. Yeah, we have big <laughs> box-ass heads. So yeah, man. how the hell did they even know? I mean, was I, it just I, like they... I'm thinking... The way, the way, the, but you know what, like the war starts, everybody just scatters everywhere. So if you're on that side, you stay on that side and the other side and 
So yeah. basically, they know a war's coming. The Serbs are like, listen, the Serbs that didn't either A, didn't want to be involved, or B, were too scared to stay, said, let's just get the hell out of here. They just went beyond the Serbian line, basically. Right? They just said, they probably they did what like, you did. They, they probably did what you did. They went back to maybe family in Serbia or Montenegro or wherever. They got out of the hot zone is what they did. Yes. Yes. And, and the, whoever, the, whoever wanted to fight, they were already – they were already hunkered down on top of the mountains with all their artillery. Yeah, I know. They surrounded the complete city. There's videos. The city, like, this was planned. Yeah. And yeah. No, there, yeah, there was videos of it. What made me sad was I saw that there was a, uh, the people of Sarajevo, all of them, Serbian, Albanian, Bosnian, Croatian, they united and they had a protest. And they were trying to storm the offices of certain politicians to say, listen, we don't want a war. You know, why do we have to have a war? Well, they got together, man. They were together. Yeah. Yes. And then you had extremists on the Serbian side start shooting. You had some yeah. Bosnians. Yeah. And that's all it took because they wanted a war anyway. Yeah. And that began the complete destruction of a country that for about, let's say 50 years had a really nice run. Yeah, for but it was, sure. It, it was very short lived. And I never understood. I mean, I never understood what, what, what was the logic in Milosevic's mind. You were handed the keys to this po powerful country and you start doing all this favoritism shit and ethnic shit or whatever. Why did you... He destroyed his... He destroyed, if the Serbian people don't realize that this guy destroyed not only the rest of Yugoslavia, he destroyed them. Yeah, man. He, uh, he left them in the third uh, world. Put him backwards. Like, we all turned backwards instead of going forward, man, for sure. It was uh, all these twisted minds and, and mentality of, I don't know, cavemen wouldn't do what, you know, what, what we did to each other, really. It was, it was really... That's why I said it's an interesting question. I mean, listen, I'm not here defending the service, man. The ones that did what they did. The ones that, the ones that did what they did, I'm saying. We're not defending or... or or accusing or supporting or anything. Yeah, you had the Croatian, what was he, the military minister? The guy committed suicide in the hate, right? I mean, yeah, they, they killed Bosnians also, civilians. Yes. That's a fact. Yes. And I'm sure there was a couple instances where Bosnians returned fire if they found a Serbian civilian because Absolutely. that's what happens when, when, when hatred just builds up. and you retaliate or, or die. You see a family getting killed, you lose your mind, man. 100%, man. You, you lose your mind. I tell everybody, so, listen, listen, you, you, you lose $20 out of your pocket. You feel so, like, stressed out, you know what I mean? And it's not about the money. You lose $20, you feel bad. Imagine losing a, a family member. Imagine That's, losing a lot of them. Or, or, or a lot. So now, losing, losing a life, is really, it's a big deal. During the Kosovo War, I lost a lot of family. My family was a part of the resistance army. Um, some of them. The rest of them were civilians. But my wife, for example, was captured by the Serbian military with her family, and they didn't die. You know, they, they could have, you know, I don't know if that's because Bosnia stopped them, but there was massacres in our country. There's no doubt about it. Oh, yeah, man. But, but, but then there was other groups that went in and wiped out whole villages. And we know for a fact that Milosevic emptied out his prisons and sent the most violent, animal, drug addict yeah. Yeah. killers there's only I someone that's a, no real soldier will kill a woman and a child. No real man. Sir. It's different if you hit, you know, with a bomb by accident, they get blown. Yeah. I'm talking about if you call yourself a man. That's why they have, that's why they have a laws in a war. You can't and you, kill a Yeah. You kill an old man who's unarmed and a woman or a child. Yeah. What happened you in know, a... You're a pussy, in man. In a Shari village, stuff like that, you know? You're a pussy. Yeah, man, it's it's really uh, and that goes for any country, any ethnic group, any oh, anyone any, that does it, any, yeah. anybody for sure. You know, for a terrorist that blows up women and children and calls himself a Muslim, I oh. hope he burns in the hottest, deepest and coals of hell. There is a verse in Quran where 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 it says if you kill one person, it's like it says if you kill mankind, absolutely. And you know, the, getting back to the media, they really played a big role in a lot of these things. And, you know, even the way they quote the Quran, for example, yeah. they use the word infidel. Infidel does not, yeah. mean, Christ, does not mean Christians and Jews. No, no, no. Infidel was used to refer to the pagan Arabs 
yes. at the time of the prophet. Yet the news today, CNN, Fox News, they always put, look at their verses. They're telling course, us they to interpret to it the way they, it sounds better to them. They breed yeah. hatred. Yes, of course. And me and you now, much later in our lives, we've lost family. You law, you, you, the last time you saw your father was one day before the holiday. Yes, sir. For 15 years, you never knew where his body was. Never. We never knew. We were always, uh, I don't want to say speculate, but other people were speculating or guessing or giving us false information because we tried everywhere. My uncle's from here, from USA, and us from Montenegro, and we tried uh, finding out where they are. You know, throughout the, back then they had these like a long frequency radios where you could call in and, you know, try to find out by name. And we didn't know. We were just, honestly, we were hoping they were transferred whether to like a camp or like some sort of, you know, where they could get exchanged back. We were hoping for a long time and the war ended. And back of your mind, you, you knew they were dead, but we, we didn't know where they were. You were hoping, look, there was, there were speculations where, where, where civilians were taken to Russia to work, like in mines and stuff. So you as a young kid, you know, you're 20, a couple years old, you're thinking, maybe my dad is in Russia somewhere in the mine. You know what I mean? You're hoping, you, you're praying, yeah. You're hoping and praying, listen, maybe my dad, one day he's just going to walk in. You know? I get but it, brother. It didn't happen. You know? So the war is going on now. When did you find out your dad died? How did you find out your dad? We uh, we never found out they were dead. We 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 found out they were taken away and and they were in this uh, concentration camp called Kula, which is a tower. It's on the suburbs of Sarajevo. And um, what we found out later, we didn't want to find out. Some of obviously it was a 37 men that died. Some of their kids and family members find out they were uh, treated like uh, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to even think about it. They were uh, put through the oh, hell and back. Tortured. They, they were tortured. Uh, I don't want to know or don't know. It was a five minutes, five days, or you know, weeks before they killed them and bury them outside of Sarajevo. Now you got a knock on the door one day from, a, from an organization that said we found what we believe to be your father in a mass grave, yes? Yeah, man, it, it, was, it was really a, uh, it was really a uh, surprise. So you lost your dad and your uncle, yes? Yes, my dad, my dad, he was 41, my uncle 24, and then my, you know, my aunt's husbands, my, my you know, and all the, all the block was, were mostly close relatives. Not close, but, but relatives. And uh, yeah, they, uh, they came in here. We, we, we went to uh, somewhere, in, uh, up, not upstate, but Connecticut to, to uh, do the blood, blood samples. It was a uh, couple of young people from, from Bosnia, doctors or whatever. They took my, my blood, my brother's blood, um, my uncle's. And my aunt also lives here. And um, getting to that point, we, we would never, actually, we would never get to that point. But uh, somebody from, from Serbian side said, uh, listen, uh, I saw what happened. They, they buried him here for an undisclosed amount of money uh, because it was a word given <clears throat> if, you know, because for years, we, we didn't know. And uh, somebody spoke, said, look, I'll bring you to a spot where, where, where the murder happened. And it happened into, in, in this, uh, it's a, a pine forest around Sarajevo. As soon as, you, as soon as you leave Sarajevo, it's like pine forest where, where, where they killed him. They brought the bulldozers and they found him. Wow. Yeah, man. So they did the DNA testings and all of that. At that time, my mom lived in Bosnia. She was, she was traveling back and forth, you know, between USA and here. But that time, she was there, and uh, they called her to uh, to identify the body. And uh, I, I said to my mom, "I really, I don't know how you did it, but you're a strong woman." She said um, that uh, 
because of the, 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 the ground, or should I say the soil, it is like a Play-Doh. It's, it's very moist. It wasn't dry. And I know very well because I used to go to my grandpa's farm, not, not far from Sarajevo. I know exactly what she's talking about. The, the soil is so thick where the bodies were preserved. They weren't packed. just like, they packed it tight. They, there was, once we buried them, honest to God, we could, we could bear, barely carry those bodies because uh, they were preserved. They weren't just a skeleton. And my mom went there and, and she said, as soon as they showed the body, she recognized the, the hand knit sweater that she made for him. That was on him. It gave you some closure, thank God. Yeah, for sure, it did. For sure, it did. And you They're, got to give him, you know, he's buried in Sarajevo? Yeah, he's buried in um, one of the biggest uh, cemetery uh, right above uh, Sarajevo, where the president is buried and all the biggest, uh, you know, the warriors, really. The four years that the war is going on, you don't know where your dad is. No. You know your mom is stuck in the city. Yeah. It's, you're watching the news. is getting blown to pieces every day for years. If it's four, if it's four weeks, it's long enough. Imagine almost you, four years. You can't go back. What the hell was going through your mind, man, during that time? Uh, once we were in Montenegro, right? Every night we were sitting with our grandparents and listening to the radio, really, in, in the countryside. Because the TV really didn't tell you much. TV was, uh, like you say, it was censored. There was like, oh, there's war going on, blah, blah, blah. So we listened to certain radio stations and just getting stressed out. Soon after, my older brother and my younger uncle came here. Here, when I say it's USA. And uh, I'd say uh, two years later, I came here. And uh, uh, you just... Uh, you, but this we, we, is during the war? I mean, during the war you came here or before the war? I came in the midst, uh, they came in the midst of, of war. They, were, they came here in 93. I came here like towards 96. You came right after? Yeah. They came in 94, I believe. And anyhow, we, we, we just, uh, we had no choice, man. You couldn't go back home. And uh, situation back then in the Montenegro wasn't great either. You couldn't get a job. You couldn't go to. You could go to school, but you know, it was really it wasn't leading you nowhere. You know. So, so your mom, those four years. So, you, like you said, a Serbian woman actually took her in at the, at the end. Yes, uh, she tra she transferred from. I, I don't want to lie, but at least four or five houses during the war. Wow, but at, at a Serbian point, woman. At one point, they were with with in, inside a house of a Serbian woman. At one point of the war. So I think that should, you know, this is an example of good people exist in every community. Percent, yes. Um, you know, and these stories existed even during Nazi Germany. There was Germans that hit Jews. And, you know, this yes. is my point, and, and this is what I want yes. people to get out of this. You could be somewhere where you grow up with everyone tomorrow. You're turning guns on each other because of other political factions, other powers and politics and whatever. And in the end, you and I both know, brother, that nobody wins in war. Because even the person that pulls that trigger, even that person that pulls that trigger, it never ends well for them. No. Look at how, look at how Milosevic's life ended. Look at Karadic. Look True. at Mladic. Look at the Croatian guy that drank poison in court. Uh, a couple of Bosnian guys that were convicted. A couple of Albanian guys. They'll have to go to jail. My point is, it does not pay. Yeah, man. These and, uh, countries were destroyed. Lives, hundreds and thousands and millions of lives were destroyed and permanently altered. Yeah. Going now, back to I, what you just said before, listen, I was just like you. I was bitter. I was hating on everybody. Long time, man. Long I was time. hating on Serbs. Not, no, not Just in the beginning, I was hating because I thought they were all the same. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and as a young guy, you're like so pissed off that you lost everything in, in the peak of life where, where you're just fuming, you know? But uh, like you said, there's, there's a good people everywhere. And there's also obviously garbage everywhere. Have you, since this war happened and everything like that, do you, do you have any Serbian friends? Have you made any Serbian friends? 
I, and, uh, since I lived here, uh, I don't want to say I, I avoid it, uh, but I avoid it for a certain reason where if you if you socialize let's say with Beck you and I were talking and third party joins where where it all ultimately leads us to a to a conversational war there's never a good conversation there's always finger pointing and uh, whose fault was it not mine and so in, in, in a sense I, I avoided having look I, I know some Serbs they're good people and all that but I, I avoided having them as my friends, saying, look, you're a really good friend of mine. We'll just hang out every day. It, it just, I sway other way just not to have more frustration on my own self, you know, because, you know, at one point you'll just blow up and maybe kill somebody. Because, look, that war didn't give nobody nothing, whether it was in Croatia or Bosnia or Kosovo. It really, we, we all lost in, in a way. You know? Everyone lost, including the Serbs. So, for me, it wasn't it wasn't reasonable for me to have a, a Serbian friend. Look again, I have nothing against none of them. But uh, well, I mean, has the opportunity even presented itself? I mean, have you even come across Serbs? I mean, have you yes, ever had these sure. discussions? Yes, I had. We had this discussion, and some of them are really uh, ashamed of other people what they did. They're ashamed. They say, "Look, dude, I, I, I'm really sorry. What happened to you and Kosovo people and?" you know, creation people, but look, if it was up to me, it would never happen. You understand? So yeah, there's, there's people that are really, they're ashamed to say they are who they are because of other fucking lunatics. You know what I'm saying? They're lunatics, the fucking animals. I mean, listen, man, you know, we've seen this throughout history over and over and over again. And that's what makes me so angry is that you think in today's world with all the technology that we have, all the movies that were made to propagate what happened in the Holocaust. And there's like a new movie made every five seconds about that war. Yeah, man. Okay. Yet we haven't learned our lesson. No, man. Uh, human, humankind, it's kind of, it's really, uh, it's sad that we don't learn lessons. It's sad. Just yesterday, I saw a lady here. I was parking I, my car when, just before you texted me. I swear I stood in my car for about, two or three minutes, this was, there was a lady, maybe, maybe 70 years old, picking out from the garbage in my neighborhood. And honestly, I was sitting in my car. I said, look, is she throwing out the garbage or is she picking up? And I'm thinking, should I just take this lady and give her money or bring it to my house? But look, how much can I do? You know what I'm saying? You're in a position where you see this. Look, it's, it's, we're living in, in pandemic. And there's this old lady I have a photo on this phone. I can't, I can't, it's, it's irrelevant right now, but it, it, we don't learn, us humans. First, our government, having that lady on, on the street like that. Do you think that exterior forces outside of the Balkans created the wars in Bosnia and, and Albania? Yeah. And also? Yes, for sure. For sure. Do, you think it was, do you think it was done to, 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 for control? Yes. Yes. Do you think that they are still playing with our countries? I think they definitely are, especially in Kosovo. Well, look, we are, yeah. we are like a, uh, you know, you play chess. We are like a pawn, really. Us humans or our, our countries, Kosovo. I don't even think they I don't even think there's sovereignty anymore, man. Yeah. I think there's guys behind the scenes that are calling the shots, making the wars happen, yeah. creating conflicts, make people yeah. hate each other so that they can control all of us. Yes, exactly. That's the whole key, man. Once you have, once you control the people, you 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 in you have upper hand, you know. Uh, you know, you have people like George Soros. He's involved yeah. in Albania. He's involved yeah. in Macedonia, yeah. northern Macedonia, as they call it now. But one hundred percent. Why does that guy care about little Albania? Why is he there? Yeah, why right? is a billion, a multi-billionaire, hanging out with the prime minister of Albania, who just committed a crime against the nation? By the way, he just tore down. The National Theater in Albania, a landmark. Ed, what's his name? Ed. Eddie Rama. Violent Eddie Rama. protest erupted today. I mean, what we're, supposed to, be wor- we're wow. supposed to be we're supposed to be worried about the virus. In the middle of the capital of the country, he tears down a national landmark, basically. Wow. No vote on it. No nothing to what to put up a new one. But you could have put the new one on somewhere next to it. Why not preserve your history? Yeah. You know, this he's been naming schools after George Soros. And I don't think I that the Albanians. That. That's kind of sad. I don't think that's the Albanians realize 
who's calling the shots in their own country. I don't think the Bosnians, the Albanians, anyone's really realizing the powers that are involved in making decisions and destroying countries and rebuilding them out of chaos order, as they yeah. say. Yeah, 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 for sure. Okay, they made the world, you know, you, know, you have 1.8 billion Muslims. Right. These are the same people that started all these wars in the Middle East out of nowhere. Right. Taking 9-11 out of the equation. There was conflicts going on in those areas. We put those people in power. Just look at the history. After the Ottoman Empire collapsed, the British and the West put these people in power, including the Saudi family. I mean, don't people read and just trace their history and go backwards and see how these pieces were put into place? You got pictures of Donald Rumsfeld going like this with Saddam Hussein. I mean, it's just, it's a joke. And at the end of the day, we don't learn. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, people like you lost their father and their uncle. I lost my cousins because of the games that these powers are playing. Amazing, isn't it? Some will call it the cabal, the Illuminati, whatever you want to call it, the elites, the military industrial complex, whatever you want to call it. It's disgusting what's going on. It's true, man. It's really, uh, we, could, we could sit here and talk about it for weeks and we won't have any conclusion to all this. Can, can the Croatian who calls himself a Catholic, the Serbian who calls himself an Orthodox Christian, the Bosnian who calls himself a Muslim, or the Albanian, right. when all three of those religions have a book that came from God, the Torah, the Gospel, and the Quran, and all three of those books say you should never kill someone, ever. True, true. Especially women and children. Yeah. And yet <laughs> all of them, some way more guilty than others, but still yeah. all, all did what they did. And they even call themselves followers of those religions. I don't think so. No. Nope. I don't. Not at all. So I hope that, um, so, so the war ends, you know, and your mom survives, which you didn't even, did you even know, like, was there, was there any communication with your mom during the war? It was really slim conversations through, uh, through uh, this radio that I said. Uh, but you knew she was alive. Right? Yeah, we, we could, we could uh, you know, we knew, yeah. They're, they're, I don't know how, I mean, the story she's, she's told us and uh, how they, not only them, but the whole city and the whole country, how they lived without food, water, Running water, electricity. Uh, you name it. You, I mean, we have everything now. We have everything, and then people are bugging out. They're killing themselves because they can't get out of the house because they've lost their purpose in life, brother. They don't know why they're alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're so we're so deadbeat as a civilization that people got to jump out of airplanes to feel a thrill. We got to feel a thrill to feel alive. You know? Yeah, man. So your mom survives the war. Did she come to you guys in Montenegro? Did you go to her? I mean, did you see Bosnia after so the she, war? I mean, she, came, she came here, though. She came oh, to she the uh, U.S. Yeah. Then, uh, like I said, my older uncle came and my older brother. Then I came and then my younger brother came after that. Um, now, you came to the U.S., right? You came to the United States of America. Now, how did you get here, man? Tell us a story. Uh, I honestly, at that time, if I knew better, I would have came as, as a normal refugee you know throughout the program which you were eligible for by the way yes but you were uh, definitely eligible yes the, the 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 problem is that i didn't have any documentations with me or or at that point what what do you have as a 17 year old uh, what no you, identity what, nothing no no id really my only id was my school id which was uh for a train we have a train one day, maybe we should travel, inshallah, to Sarajevo to see how beautiful it is. We have a train that I would goes love to. on. On, it's like a, like those trains in London and stuff. They're they're not sub, they they travel on above top. ground. Yeah, above yeah, ground. above ground. So I had that ID to travel to go to school. That's it. So when I came here, honestly, uh, in Montenegro, there was no other way but to to pay a guy, and you know he would make you a passport. You. Transport, yeah, it gave you a passport with visa, transfer you to Albania, which I came through Tirana. And um, you're welcome, you're welcome, brother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, yeah, I tried. Uh, I tried to uh, cross the border. At that time, it was war, right? We went to uh, Tuzi, and this big guy, a lot of people know him, Bello. Um, he couldn't trans uh, transport us to. To he said, "Listen, it, it's hot. I can't. You know, I can't over over River Boyana." He said, "I can't. I can't take a chances." We went to uh, Podgorica. They said, "No, we can't because it's, you know hot." And then we went to Ulcin. And uh, I jump on this boat in the morning, and they transport me over the river. Went to Tirana. I, uh, there I went from Tirana. I uh, I went to Vienna, which is Austria. Tirana I, was a shit show back then. Listen to me. The, when the airplane took in ninety ninety six, when it took off, the the wings were like flopping like this because the, the 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 runway wasn't flat. I said, dude, I'm not taking off today. <laughs> barely <laughs> took off. It barely took off. And obviously. I remember <laughs> I was in uh, Albania in 96, right before the pyramids collapsed and the Civil War broke out there. I couldn't wait to get the hell out of there. Now it's freaking beautiful. There. I have friends from Albania and, and they invited me every day. And I was beautiful. Planning, I was planning on going, going this summer. We'll see what happens. So I go well, listen, to Ulchen. Ulchen is great, but you got to yeah. see the beaches in Albania, man. Yeah. Yeah, I was in Ulton before before war uh, with my parents. So anyhow, uh, I go to Austria. I spent there almost a day waiting for a transfer to go to New York. And um, when I came here, the the picture on the passport was so bad. Uh, I was I was a Marine of some sort from Slovenia joining the troops. <laughs> it's bullshit, bro. <laughs> Luckily, I knew some English. In Albania, obviously, they let me go because I paid some guy like 400 bucks to just bring me. I could have brought, you know, bags of whatever. On the yeah, over in Albania, hundred dollars, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> and, uh, in Austria, this this lady on a, on a checkpoint, she started talking to me. Oh, you're you're a Navy guy, blah blah blah. I was just yeah, nice job, blah blah blah. She, dude, she let me go. When I came here, the guys were like on, on the JFK. They said, "How the hell did you get here?" <laughs> they looked at my photo back, back then was like USA passport had a plastic over the photo yeah peeling off like uh, anyhow uh, at that time my uncle was waiting for me to, to bring me to his house but they changed the law they said no more you can't take the guy from the airport and bring him home he's coming with us so I ended up being in jail for seven months now which airport you flew to JFK yeah <laughs> welcome to New York huh yeah man uh, <laughs> I spent five months in Queens, a uh, month in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania. How old were you, man? I was uh, 19. I was, uh, yeah, I was with my buddy uh, from, from Pristina in jail. We're still good friends here. And then I spent a jail, uh, month in jail in, in Elizabeth. Now, I'm going to tell you a funny story how I got out of jail. Because at that point, USA got educated and they said, look, we are getting so many people from Europe. They're all claiming they're Bosnians, right? You have a guy from Kosovo or Romania or Greece or Bulgaria. They're all claiming they're from Bosnia, right? And they come here, boom, boom. They gave them papers. So, US, you know, Americans got smart. They said, look, we have to stop this. And I said, look, you're going to stop it when I'm coming? <laughs> so anyhow. I went to my first hearing and after two months, they, they postponed it after two months. And then finally, after like fourth or fifth hearing, I have the real court date with the judge because everything else was through a microphone and blah, blah, blah. Right. So he, the judge asked me through, through the interpreter, uh, say, you claiming you're Muslim, right? I said, yes. He said, uh, how many times Muslims pray a day? Uh, I said, five times. Luckily, my, my grandpa my, my, from my mom's, mom's side was an uh, imam. He taught us a lot about Islam. <laughs> so he said, oh, yeah, five times. So when do they pray? I said, they play, pray in the morning, noon, afternoon, on a, on a sunset. And, you know, I explained. Nighttime. Right. He said, um, so you claim you're from Sarajevo? I said, yes. He goes, Dude, I'll never forget this. This is 24 years ago. I was in a big orange jumpsuit, 
fucking chains, handcuffs, shackles, you name it. And a big table, like long table. I see, I see like maps of Bosnia. I could tell he had these big books, you know, opened. And he said, does Gavrilo Princip ring a bell? Gavrilo Princip was a Serbian uh, guy that started a, a war. 1389. See, you know history. The Battle of Kosovo. He killed, uh, he killed uh, Prince Ferdinand in, in, uh, in Sarajevo on that bridge. So I said, yeah, I know Gavrilo Princip, but I don't, know, you know, I don't know much about him. He said, oh, okay. Is there any, um, you know, anything named after him, like a park, a street, a museum, a school, or any type of city, part of city where it's named after Gavrilo Princip? I said, yes, there is a bridge. He said, okay, where is the bridge? I said, dude, I was going to high school, passing, you know, the train every day I knew. I explained exactly where that bridge is, where, where this murder occur occurred. Obviously, it's a, it's a historical uh, site. And uh, I see the prosecutor, the one that was on my side, she, was, she started like tearing up. I said, dude, I didn't get granted shit. I'm going back to cell. The, the judge got up and he said, welcome to America. Gavrilo Princip saved your life. I swear. That guy, and that guy started World War One. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That man. guy started World War One, bro. So, so, yeah. Which, by we, the way, by the way, right, that's another example of extremism, right? That led to a world war. Yeah, man. Yeah. That, so, that assassination was done by a Serb. I mean, come on, yeah. guys. Take it easy. Serbians, yeah, if you're man. watching this, take it yeah, easy. Yeah, man. Please, just take it easy, man. Stop, stop. Chill out. Just chill out. <laughs> yeah, chill the hell Let's out. Let's drink some espresso, man. Yeah. Let's just chill. Let's yeah, Shit. man. And, and yeah, Our people have had enough war, man. All of us. Americans Seriously. got ed educated and they said, listen, none of you are coming anymore if you're not from certain parts of wherever you come from. So, That's yeah, crazy, man. man. So, you had to point, he had pointed out uh, this guy's name. You had to know where this bridge was. And Dude. then he goes, Welcome to America, Gabo Prince of. Saved yeah, your life. life. That's yeah, crazy. And I, had no, I had no identity or educations. I when he told you at that point that you're going to be American, what went through your mind? Dude, I was crying like a baby. And yeah. uh, like I said, I, uh, I, I transferred from two different jails. They let you out that day? They took the, the chains off yeah. and everything? They lost my luggage. I had some cassettes, you know, video cassettes. I had a couple of T-shirts and they lost it. They said on the checkout, they said, we lost your stuff. We don't. I said, can I, can I leave like this in a jumpsuit, the orange jumpsuit? They said, you have no choice because, you know, you could leave like that. I got out in a jumpsuit like in a movie. <laughs> I got out. I was like, dude, can, I, can you just let me out, man? It was actually around this time, May. I got out in May. It was hot outside. My uncle was driving an old Chevy. We're going from Elizabeth to New York. I'm like in my jumpsuit and slippers. I never forget. And my aunt was there. We were all fucking crying, dude. Happy. Yeah. I said, if we find this stuff, we'll send it to you. I said, don't you worry about it. Just let me out. I, give you me the thing. Was America everything you thought it would be? At that time, yes, honestly. Uh, it was, uh, we're talking uh, late 90s. You know, it was, economy was good. Um, it, was, it was good, man. It was good. Definitely. What is your fear for our country right now, America? Uh, honestly, biggest fear is uh, what's happening right now. We, we're, we're uh, in a sense, getting betrayed by our leaders, which happened to my homeland. We got betrayed, us human dirt. That's why we got treated. There's no doubt in your, there's no doubt that history has shown that the people of Yugoslavia were betrayed by the people that were in power there's no doubt about it and 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 honestly, that war could have been avoided that war could have been avoided. honestly us when i say us as 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 former yugoslavians we were we were tough people man whether you're a serb croat a muslim albanian a jew we were tough in a sense of of, of we, we we didn't get rattled quickly we, we lived for years in 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 harmony it, for years we had no beef man we had no for the no most beef. part for the most we part. Had, yeah we did but we got 
we got set up and and it almost worked out for them. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think about how easily people are willing to give up their right to the Second Amendment to bear arms as someone's family who was killed in a war and seeing how evil human beings can be to each other? Do you think that Americans are stupid or smart if they allow gun control? What's your opinion? I, I honestly think that's, that's the best a law that we have in the Constitution. Because the best, the best, the best right on the Bill of Rights, the Second right. Amendment. A hundred percent, best Why? law, but best right, where it showed in other countries and uh, in the whole entire world, if you don't have protection for yourself or your family, you could be gone overnight. And I'm not saying, hey, have a gun and go walk around and you know, show your muscles. It's for your own protection and. And if you have that as, as, as your right, it should never be taken away from you. What about fully automatic weapons? I mean, I've always been under the impression, I mean, it's there if, if oppression starts, right? Like, shouldn't you have the same type of firepower that your enemies could have? I mean, yes. I, I don't know. What, what is your thought on that? Yes, 100%. Where, where I've seen a lot of questions being raised. Oh, you don't need a, you know, M60 to go hunting. Most of the people don't go hunt, man. People go, I like to go to, you know, once in a while with a bunch of guys who go, you know, shoot the range. And uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that I don't need an automatic rifle, you know? And Let me ask you a question. I mean, I know that in the rural areas, maybe, they would have had a better chance of fighting. But in the case of Sarajevo, I mean, even if everybody had guns, I mean, how was I even going to help them when they were just being shelled from far away? I mean, yeah. you still think no matter what, it's better to have a gun than not have a gun. hundred percent. It's better to have something than nothing, man. A lot of people died on their doorstep just waiting to get slaughtered. Unarmed. Because they, they had nothing. They had nothing to protect themselves with. Now, the Srebrenica massacre, which happened in July of 95 was one of the greatest war crimes in the history of modern history. Now, all of these men and boys were unarmed. Right. They were in a United Nations camp. Right. It was declared a safe zone, and the United Nations allowed the Serbian military to come in, and over the course of a week, massacre, this is fact, this is not made up, this is not an opinion, they massacred 8,300-something right. unarmed men and boys. And to me, that is the proof of why we have the Bill of Rights and why the Second Amendment exists. Yeah, I Those agree. men and boys wouldn't have been killed if they had something to fight back with. Not all of them, at least. Yeah. Um, I think they just got bullied. The UN got bullied by, uh, by these uh, leaders. There's no, no doubt about it that Bosnia definitely received the short end of the stick. There's, there's, yeah. I mean, uh, you guys, do you even have any access to the coast? We have, we have. A it's little not piece. Much. It's not much. Smallest part of uh, the. Thank Adriatic. God you got something. Though. At least you, you know. At least you got something. <laughs> we'll let you. We'll let you Kosovars come through Bosnia and go to our beach. <laughs> don't go to. Don't go to Ultin. I'm just kidding. So how is the beach? Is it a beach for swimming too or not? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it is. But again, then, it's it's small. Small. Yeah, it must part. be packed though. It must be yeah. packed. Though. Well, nice. Huh? Yeah. What message do you want to send out to maybe the Serbians if they're watching, just a regular Serbian person or other people that come from our part of the world? Do you have something? I mean, as someone that lost family in this war, what do you want to say to them and what advice do you have to their children and to the future generations of our people? Uh, I would have to maybe think about that one, but uh, just on top of my head, uh, that's how I like the answers, right? On the top of your head, no time to prepare. Don't be human, man. No matter what happened yesterday or the day before, it's history. I tell my kids sometimes, they come back, you know, if we go to these basketball games and stuff, they like lost, they lose a game and they like, they can't get over it. I said, listen, that game is history. It's gone. You can't dwell on it. You can't sit, up, sit and think about it, how negative, how bad of a game you had or, or how bad of a game your teammates had. It's history. So. So I don't like to, not that I want to forget about it, but you, you, don't, you don't dwell on history, what happened. You want to move forward and be, you know, kind and human. 
to everybody, no matter what, because you don't know where you end up, where you're going to end up living or working or with who, or, or who's going to be your boss or no matter the circumstance, you have to be positive and, you know, keep on going, man. And don't, don't dwell on the past. What advice do you have to someone who maybe has experienced enormous loss in their life? Maybe someone in their family just died, whether they were murdered, because a lot of murder here in the United States of America. Their family was murdered or killed, or they lost family unexpectedly. How the hell did you get through it, man? Like, what, what helped you get through it? What advice do you have to someone who has suffered extraordinary loss? Because I don't um, want people to give up. That's the whole point of this show, man. Yeah. I don't yeah. want, listen, you lose family, people commit suicide, man. They get so sad. Yeah. I, I understand yeah. my heart aches for them. But what did you tell your mind? I mean, what, how did you get through it, man? Was it family? I mean, how yeah, did I'm you find them? Because that, that's a very devastating loss, man. Yeah, I, like as I mentioned earlier, uh, my, my, my grandpa, my grandfather, my, my mom's dad, um, he was actually the first victim of the war from our side. He was the one that came in front of the Serbs and said, listen, guys, get out of this block. We don't want no problems. You know what I mean? Just get out of here. And they shot him he's, right there. He's actually classified as the first casualty. Yeah, he was He was the only one where, where we know that he got killed by one of our, not neighbors, but a bunch of them. We don't know who, who fired the shot. It was a rifle, or should I say uh, multiple rounds. And... Uh, why I'm talking about him, he was the imam. He taught us about a lot, a lot. Uh, we were 12 grandchildren. He, has, he had four daughters. And he taught us back back in the days, uh, he taught us about Islam and, and how to behave, how to be a human, uh, how to... He used to tell us, we were, we were like in the country, so he was a very rich guy. He, re, he lived very humble. He was, all you could see this guy was carrying a book under his armpit. He was traveling somewhere. He always read. He was very well educated. He used to tell us, uh, oh, if you like end up in this fancy French restaurant, this is where the spoon is, and this is where the fork is, like that. Uh, uh, we're, we're in a village here. We're eating bread and cheese and like, you know, suhameso. <laughs> like, like, listen, no matter what, you need to know how to, act in a certain situations right so i learned i and we learn a lot from him and um when i was in these situations i thought about him a lot honestly he taught told us a thing called sabur which means patience, patience. and honestly that 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 sabur saved me you know saved me from probably probably uh you know maybe doing harm to myself because we all get down on ourselves after a tragedy strikes where, where you don't know what to do. But if you, if you uh, just, uh, how am I going to say, not for, forget, uh, maybe forgive to yourself in that moment saying, look, damage has happened, it's done. You know, you need to move, move forward. That's, it's very hard to, to, to do it. But if you could have sabr saying to yourself, look, this person has died and and that's it. I can't do nothing about it, but to move forward. And uh, again, our gran grandfather taught us a lot about this life, that this life is just uh, like a movie, like a test. And we, 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 we're, we experience it as we speak, where this life is just going by, man, going by. Just a few years ago, I was 20, I was 30, same like you, you know, when nothing, everything stays, but time goes just like our, our lives, you know, and, and to look forward to a next life. If you're, if you're real. So what I'm, what I'm hearing that is spirituality has helped you get through this belief in God, knowing that there'll be a day where everyone will stand judgment for what they've done. Yes. You truly, you truly believe that something like that. There's a day like yes, that. Sir. If I didn't believe that, I want to be sitting here talking to you right now. I think so. Also, um, to be honest with you, if you pick up any, level, any book, whether it's a Quran, or, or Torah or Bible or any of the of major religions, it tells you that this life, it's a test for all of us where one day you will be sitting in front of the creator and you're going to answer for your actions. And there's Whether a lot of people that fail in that test, brother. I hope we don't fail. I, I hope so, man, for, for, for all of us. 
Um, though I, I want to give you my uh, deepest condolences to you and your family. We remember the victims of the Bosnian War on the 28th anniversary. We remember all the victims of the wars of the Balkans, the innocent civilians that were caught. And we pray that our people, all of our peoples of Eastern Europe, can wake up, allow each other to coexist, maybe one day resume and have good relations. We don't have to live in the same exact piece of land, but we can yeah. visit each other. We can sell things. We can do business. And we can not forget the past because then we would repeat it. Yes. Remember the past and try to forgive. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. you know, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Although, uh, again, uh, we thank you so much for telling your story to us. We hope that anyone that watches this worldwide from all the communities learn not only from this. This is, this is just one story of thousands that have happened yeah. over the last 30 years. Oh, that's uh, for sure. and, and even more than that. And hopefully the people of Eastern Europe wake up and realize who the real enemies are. Yes, man. I appreciate you for having me. And uh, thank you for your work, man. I want to wish you a happy end of Ramadan and a happy Eid or Bayram, as you guys say it. Yes. And uh, have a beautiful day with your family. And we will, I will be thinking of your father on this Eid. I thank you very much, man. And you have a great day. And uh, brother, we will be in touch. And uh, yeah. I'll let you take me for a plus cavita. Oh, maybe we, we meet up in Astoria. He will. Astoria maybe... is some of the best. Plus cavita, <laughs> for those of you that are listening or watching that are not from the Balkans, is basically, I call it like a Balkan burger, basically. Right. Slap on. But it's not, a, it's not really, you can't really call it a cheeseburger or a hamburger. But, but yeah, it's very, it's related. Yeah, they're cousins. They're cousins, and man, are they delicious, especially, I go to that place sometimes, the Busta Express, or whatever it's called. I'm All sure right. there's other places in Astoria yeah. that are yeah. good, but. We'll go to Bronx. We'll go. There's plenty of places. I want to thank you for, for, for allowing me to, to tell people this story, and uh, I consider you a brother now, and I thank you very much. Thank and you. I would love to visit Sarajevo one day in Bosnia. And, uh, one day you'll never know, man. We'll have a bunch I've of I've never been to Montenegro. Yeah. You, 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 have you been? No, I have not been. And part of that also, to be honest with you, if we're going to be frank here, you know, I've had my own difficulty in visiting and hearing the language. It's been hard for me. 100%, but, I agree with you. But, but, I'm, but I'm ready now. I'm ready yeah. now. Yeah, good. Good. I'm ready hopefully, now. I'm ready hopefully now. this uh, nightmare ends soon and we all go about our lives and... Maybe we go travel together, man. Yeah, I feel bad that people over there are in trouble this year. If there's not a big tourist season, they're in trouble. Yeah, it really is. It's it All is. of them are in trouble. That's including Serbia, Albania, Bosnia, Kosovo. All year, it's uh, just going to them back. Okay, because everyone goes back there in the summer. That's a big influx of money from out west. And yeah. uh, I don't know how they're going to get through the next year without the tourists coming through. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Including Greece. Yeah, everywhere. Brother, thank you so much, man. God bless you. I'll be in touch. Thank you for this. Uh, this will be up uh, probably by tomorrow. We do okay. a new episode well, every Monday. You, I'll keep in and, touch. Uh, and uh, we want everyone to know this. No matter how hard your life has been, you might have been in a war. You might have lost family. Your own family can be discovered in a mass grave. This man right here is showing you that no matter what happens, God has designed you to not give up to keep moving on. You might lose your family, God forbid, in a car accident. Something horrible can happen. You never give up. That's what the devil wants you to do. Keep your head up. The devil wants you to give up. This yes. man is proof that you can lose everything, even lose your father, your uncle, people that you love. But life goes on and you can move on. And he succeeded. He came to America, started a new life, started a family. He has children that I'm sure when you see them, you know your father would be proud because you didn't give up. Yeah. And this is Beck Lover on another episode. And by the way, you're number 25. 25th episode of Beck Lover and the Comeback Team. And just remember one thing. No matter how bad things can be, you can always make a comeback. <laughs> comeback. Yeah, man. Have True. a great day, brother. I'll see you soon. You too. Peace. Bye-bye. Yeah.